course. Longtime listeners to the show are familiar with my cool cats model <clears throat> that distinguishes highly effective CMOs. In fact, if you go back to episode zero, that's way back there over four years ago, you can actually hear me talk about cats. Well, it's an acronym for courageous, artful, thoughtful, and scientific. And it's an acronym that I developed after having interviewed 200 CMOs and I was finished my first book and folks said to me, hey, Drew, what makes a CMO special? And I started thinking about it and isolated those four characteristics. Well, here we are now in over 400 uh, CMO interviews and I am more convinced than ever that these are the essential characteristics of a highly effective CMO. And you're gonna hear it right now today in today's episode featuring Kevin Sellers of Ping Identity. Because what you're gonna learn is how we move from a courageous strategy to an artful ideation, which in turn drove thoughtful execution that is being measured scientifically. All right, with that, Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Drew. Happy Friday. Thanks for having me. Happy Friday, indeed. Now, did you realize you were among the cool cats? Well, I no, but thank you. Uh, I guess I've got something to go talk to my wife about after this. So uh, thanks for uh, including me in that. Category. Yeah, you know, you can add that to your sort of happy hour celebration. Uh, yeah, I'm a cool cat. Huh? I heard it from Drew. So I'll, must put be right on my, I'll put it right on my CV and you know, it'll be, it'll be part of my remit now. So. There you go. All right. Well, speaking of that, you arrived at uh, Ping Identity, uh, gosh, what a, a, just about a year and a half ago. Yeah, just under a year and a half ago, uh, kind of summer, early summer of last year. Okay. And what was your mandate? Well, the mandate was you've got this company that's kind of post startup. It's a couple hundred million dollars of ARR, and, but yet not growing at the rate it could, mostly because it was still so unknown. So one of the big things they were looking for was somebody that could come in and really help sort of defined a brand platform and strategy for them and really helped drive them into sort of the much broader awareness of the technology they deliver and kind of who they are. So that was the biggest part of the remit among, of course, all the other things, grow revenue and, you know, all the other things you got to do. But, but a lot what's, of inter what's interesting to me here is that many times uh, CMOs on this show, when I ask them what their mandate was, it was drive demand. Yeah. And What's interesting about your background is you have the brand experience because you spent what, 12 years at Intel? Actually 23 years. Oh. Old. Yeah. A lot of it in brand, both international and global um, and also in advertising and so forth. But uh, yeah. So, and to me, when a CEO asks for awareness, yep. what's, it, what's interesting there is that one of, one of two things happened. Uh, he checked into a hotel and they hadn't heard of the company. He went to the country club and somebody hadn't heard of the company or the sales guys finally complained and said, nobody's heard of us. This is costing us business. Right. Otherwise, it feels like the world of technology of marketers is about come in, drive demand, like as if awareness was not a part of that, as if brand recognition wasn't important. And, and it just, it's always cracks me up that you could, there was this notion that you could generate demand without awareness. I totally agree. And it, you know, it's interesting because I don't think people appreciate what awareness does. It's not just about, it's not a vanity play. What awareness does is, especially in a B2B world where awareness actually gets you into the short list. You can't, win business if you don't even get a chance to bid on the deal, right? So initially it plays into the demand that way, but it also does so much as a multiplier to your demand gen efforts. You know, if you show up at the door, knock on the door and say, I've got this really cool product, will you buy it? Buy it. Yeah, you'll sell a few. But if you're showing up at the door and people know who you are and a lot about what you're all about, and you say, I've got this really special thing I want to sell you, your effectiveness goes way up. So it really is it's not just about being more known. It's about making that funnel much bigger and, and ensuring that your demand activities are more effective as a result. You know, it's funny, as you were telling that story, I, I actually thought back to my first client in advertising way back when I, you know, I can age myself. I don't care. 1979, my first client was Century 21 Real Estate. And at that time, 
They had over 7,500 offices and every single agent and broker wore a gold jacket. Yeah. And so all you had to do was put on that gold jacket and it's like, oh, you're that friendly guy from the commercial. The awareness that they had with that jacket and the thing was unbelievable. And again, I know this seems obvious, folks, but what you were talking about there through the line, I think from an awareness standpoint is so important. It's, yeah, you got to get on the short list, but if there are 14 people involved in the decision, which there often are with a technology purchase, yeah. if one of them or five of them haven't heard of you, the likelihood is they're going to say no because they're looking for excuses to say no. So anyway, we could beat this one up, but awareness matters. All right, so that's your remake, get awareness, then build demand uh, as a result of that awareness. Let's talk about the process that you went to because it's not just about, hey, we're ping identity and, and you just do ads and go ping, 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 right? You, you could, but you went for some kind of strategic story. Talk about how you got to the story and then we'll get to what that is. Sure, you know, I think, um... You know, a great brand is not about a clever catchphrase or a, a you know sort of a really creative position. It really is a it's a process of discovery of the soul, and uh, to to be genuine and really authentic is the place you have to be. And to get there takes a lot of work. So you know, I have done this a few times in my career. We rebranded Intel when I was there. I rebranded Avnet when I was a CMO at Avnet uh, for much of the same reason. And we came into Ping and we said, it's not so much it needs a rebrand, it just needs clarity and it needs that sort of authentic, unique position. So you go through the process of discovery and it's a, it's a, it's a really gut-wrenching, painful process, but a fun process. And the process that we deploy kind of has a, we, we kind of look at it in, uh, uh, through a litmus of three core things. One is your position needs to be really simple. You can't make a you can't break through with a really complicated position. So we use the lens of simplicity. We use the lens of unique and differentiated, meaning what is that secret sauce that makes me special and different? And then the third thing is, is what is that emotional position and connection that you really ultimately are trying to make with your constituency? And if you use that as sort of a filter, it guides you as you kind of go through the process of learning what do customers think about you, what do partners think about you, what do your employees think about you, uh, you, you, you look at how your products resonate in the marketplace. There's a whole lot of things you do, but it leads you to a process that says, you know, what's really true, authentic, and unique about this company is this. And then you build then, that's when the art comes in as you do the, the sort of artful work around how to position and message that brand position. But that's an important part of the hard work to do up front is that soul discovery that you need to get your brand right. Well, it's funny that you... Uh use that uh, language. It's, it's funny. Uh, so in, in the courageous strategy, I've got my little uh, 12 steps, ridiculously simple steps to uh, uh, building a uh, band, brand using it. And uh, step one is clear away the cl clutter. And step two is dare to be distinct. And step three is pounce on your purpose. And, and all of those things you just sort of describe uh, in, yeah. in just yeah, to the letter. We have yeah. to keep it simple. And what's so hard is in technology, there's a, often an issue of, well, but it does this and yes. it also does this yes. and we also does this. And so yes. this is where the marketer and say the product marketer uh, or the engineer often butt heads is wait, yeah. wait, you can't, you got to talk about this. And, and in truth, you'll get to that. But if you don't have that clear, simple story, um, it's very hard for everybody to wrap their mind around it internally and externally. Okay, so simple, unique, um, and emotional. Um, let's talk about where you ended up in the articulation of that of that positioning. Sure. Well, in Ping, really quickly, what Ping Identity does is it's an identity and access management provider, meaning we secure identity for both employee and for customer to enable them to transact with you securely anywhere, anytime, any device. Uh, again, whether it's an employee accessing the network or whether it's a customer transacting with you digitally. But we do that to authenticate and authorize. So you create robust security, but you also do it in a way that allows for a frictionless and very seamless experience. We all know that experience is sort of the new currency of this digital first economy. 
And so the technology that we provide allows for both a, a great experience, but a robustly secure one as well. And so the, the, the process led us to this place. We, what, some of the things we learned about who we are and what's really authentic about Ping is, one, we champion identity. It, it's, uh, the, the company was founded in 2002, back when it wasn't even a thing. And so we pioneered this notion of identity and, and managing and securing at the identity level. So what that means is instead of building walls to keep the bad people out, break the walls down. We don't care about the walls anymore. We, if I know that it's Drew and I can authenticate that it's Drew, then I can enable you to have a great experience with me, a secure experience with me, whether you work at this place or whether you're trying to transact with me. So we, we, we champion identity and we also have this amazing customer support. I mean, our NPS scores are world-class and have been forever. We're, we're well known to take care of our customers. So what we came up with, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm shortening months of work into a few sentences here, but we came up with this position of, we champion your identity to enable secure, extraordinary digital experiences. And that's a, that's a two-part statement that the top is, who are we? We, mm -hmm. we, we champion identity. And what are we about? We're about securing that identity to enable secure, extraordinary digital experiences. And so when we, when we got to that position, what was great is the management team and the employees just were like, that's it. That, I mean, that's who we are. That's, you know, so when you see the light bulbs go off, you know you've done your work right because you didn't just think of something clever in a you know, smoke-filled room. You did it because you found that soul, right? And that's what was special about that position. So the end end benefit of championing identity is better experiences, right? Is that I just short better thing? And, okay. and secure, right? Yep. And what was the what? And and secure and better experiences together, right? So you got to have both. Okay, secure and better. Got it. All right. Those are great words. That's a strategy. Sure. And it's a clear positioning that the employees sure. can rally around. How does you how did you initially communicate that to your employees and then customers yeah. and I'm prospects? And what order did you communicate it? You know, we had a we had a we had a, a fairly inclusive process. I mean, as you would know, and you've and, and, and all the CMOs you've interviewed. Marketing is an interesting animal. It can't be too participatory because everyone's an expert on marketing, right? So, um, but in this case, when you're doing this kind of work, you want it to be participatory because it's like, again, you're discovering something and they're helping you discover what that soul really is. And then our work was to kind of get the language right. But once we did that work, we started rolling it out to the employees in, in larger sort of groups and getting some feedback. And, and again, such positive reception and a lot of very important tops down support from the board to the CEO on down. Uh, and, and of course the CEO is involved at every step of the way. And that's a, a, one of the important learnings when you're doing this kind of work, you know, don't do the work and then present it, make sure the CEO is involved in this because it's, it's important, right? It's, it's so important. Uh, and as we rolled it out, you know, obviously that, you know, the light bulbs turning on were, was really, really gratifying. And, and so we, we kind of knew we had it, but now, you know, and what, what I like too is no other, player in our space was talking like this. That's, that's an important thing, right? Uh, I remember when I presented this to the board, there was one board member particularly, he said, you know, but we should just tell everybody that we're the trusted partner. And in my head, I thought to myself, okay, how do I, how do I take on this board member without having, you know, a debate and open, you know, sort of an open debate, but that's what everybody says. Yeah. And marketing isn't about showing up saying what everybody else is saying, right? You've got to have yourself a position that is unique, uniquely special to you. And so I kind of took that feedback and quietly and politely ignored it. But um, that's, that's the thing is we found something not only that was true and unique, but it was also very differentiated. It was language, it was tone, that was not what everybody else was saying. Because everybody else talks about their products and they talk about you know, how, how trusted those products are. And this was a different approach, right? We're about championing you, championing your business, championing your customers, and so we, got, we knew we had that right. Now we have to get into execution, right? And, right. Turn and, and I'm going to pause you there because we need to take a break, but I want to just summarize that. So first of all, key thing was you weren't the hero of the story, <laughs> right? You're, you're helping others. Uh, this courage part is this moment 
where you dare to be distinct. This is the moment where the board guy says, well, can't we just say what everybody else says? And yeah. that's the courage moment, folks. That is what I mean. You have to be able to stand up and defend distinctiveness, because if you can't do that, if you're going to not fight that battle one way or another, you are not going to help your business. And, you know, CMOs don't have that much time generally when they're, but you really, you're, if you don't have the courage, dare to be distinct, you know, you got a very short window because you're just going to be saying the same thing as everybody else. All right. With that, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay. We're back. And we've been talking about the need for a courageous strategy, which you defined as um, being simple, unique, uh, having some kind of emotional hook. As it turned out, it also meant putting your 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 customer uh, at making them the hero of the story as opposed to your brand. Now let's get to execution. Oh, and one other thing that I wanted to mention is that marketing is a game of we. But you're right. You can't just say, hey, everybody submit your ideas and we'll, because it just doesn't work. I mean, they're not all language. They're not all designers. They can't keep it because then you have this mishmash, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen. So, but they need to feel like they're part of the process and, and they need to embrace it. So somehow or other, you have to get them involved in the beginning. I love the fact that your CEO was involved. You're absolutely right. When it comes to rebranding, if the CEO is not involved, then what happens is you go out there with it and the CEO just ignores it and it dies. So, all right. So let's talk about execution now because I know there's, there's sort of two things that you did. There's the first stuff and then I want to get to the really fun stuff that you ended up doing after that. So let's talk about the first stuff you did. Well, the first step was, okay, how do we take this and, and turn it into you know, a story that can be told across obviously multiple channels and uh, so we, you know, we went off and created again some very, very unique content that really focuses on championing identity and create and, and demonstrating what it means to have a really great experience. We did it, you know, through all of the different types of assets you can imagine. And I remember the the, the best, most gratifying part was when we took this whole idea into a sort of a manifesto video as a kickoff and showing that to all the sales force at our sales kickoff. Uh, in January of this year was, you know, we got a spontaneous standing ovation. Again, it was a, because you, we, we tapped into that emotional connection, right? We talk about identity. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing because there's only one Drew. There's only one of you. And you, that's the only thing that you actually authentically own. Now, somebody may say, well, but I can get my identity stolen. Well, really what you're getting is your identity mimicked. Mm -hmm. No one can take your identity. And it's the only uniquely personal thing that there is. And so there's already built in sort of an emotional thing there. And when we talk about how we champion that identity to enable the next generation of business, it's a powerful, powerful concept. And it's already built in with emotion. So we just told that story and we, we showed how identity can come to life. And, and it was a powerful thing. And then we just, like I said, we built a campaign. And what was great about it is because it was so distinctive and distinctively different than the tone and the types of language that our competition was using, the performance was outstanding, right? It, it, I mean, we got, our engagement rate was two and three X industry benchmarks across all asset types. Um, you know, we felt really, really good about that first round of creative. And yet in my head, I knew that we just were still missing something, right? We were still missing something. And that kind of, you know, led to that second chapter. That so I as you, so this January you do that, I love that manifesto to the employees that I'm imagining there was some communication to customers in, in getting them involved. Uh, uh, then at what point now COVID hits in March and April, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's got to mess things up a little bit. Did you yeah. uh, have to adjust uh, as a result of that? Well, we actually ended up launching at full scale in April, right in the middle of COVID. And so, you know, we did some, some tweaks, obviously, you know, it was funny because everybody stampeded to the space of in these unprecedented times and we're in this together. Right. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> as it'll be again, a sea of sameness that we want to avoid, but um, we did a few minor tweaks, but what we stepped back and we had to reevaluate and go, okay, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Is this the right message to send out? And we came back and said, yes, it's incredibly human. It's very optimistic. And it deals with the foundation of what COVID is really saying, which is 
you better be as a business able to engage both in customers and your employees digitally, or you're going to die. I mean, it's, you know, digital transformation because of COVID moved from important to strategic and then from strategic to existential, <laughs> so, you know, and that's kind of the evolution. And so the good news is our message fit the, that narrative well, but it did it in a way that was very humanized, very optimistic, um, and very positive in its tone, which is exactly what I think uh, helped it perform so well, especially in a, you know, in a, in a COVID environment. Okay. So what I'm not hearing is the big idea that gets you a lot more awareness. Content sure. is sure. great. You can put money behind it and so forth, but you didn't quite, as, as you were saying, something was missing, uh, you know, that I, I, I feel like there's another level here for this campaign. <laughs> there is. And, and a lot of it's big and it, it just simplistically, you can do these types of things and there's kind of one of two paths you have to take. One, you can take the Geico route where you just buy eyeballs everywhere they are and your message is just constantly streamed in front of those eyeballs. Uh, most of us can't afford the Geico approach, right? So when you're in a, a smaller budget situation like we're in, you know, and I came from Intel, which was a big budget spender, but paying obviously a much smaller company, you, it really leans heavily into that content had better really work and it had better travel, right? And so that's why we loved what we were getting out of it, but I just, I needed a little more media push to really get the kind of reach and frequency that I needed. And I wasn't gonna do it with my budget. So what was missing is how do I really activate this to be a much more earned media friendly type of a campaign, which is obviously all marketers nirvana, which is obviously easy to talk about and really hard to execute. But that's that's where we uh, sort of went into phase two of this was to really uh, really and take what that. period. So this gets us from we we had the launch in April and then when does the new campaign and maybe you can start to yeah, just... yeah we launched in uh, early October so it's been you know now a couple of months long. okay and um, we will share the video the Terry Crews video in the show notes. Um, for those folks watching uh, in uh, on video, well, you'll have to go to the uh, renegade.com to look at the this the the video. But anyway, talk about how uh, this the, how you got to the decision of of actually creating a, a, an identity champion or a, whatever you call Terry identity champion. Yeah. Well, you know, as we were looking at at how do you you know. I've been looking at, and I've been, I've used before influencers and influencer marketing. We all know a lot about it. We've seen great examples and some bad examples and everything in between, you know, influencer marketing done well can be exceptionally powerful and it's all based on science, right? Uh, people generally respond more favorably when they hear someone they know and trust talk about a brand more so than when they hear a brand talk about a brand or their own brand, right? So we started off talking about our own brand and we did well with it, but I, I knew that we weren't gonna get the reach we needed. So we looked at this influencer concept and it's, again, it's all based in science. The brain lights up differently when an influencer gives the message that you have rather than you. There's just all kinds of really important science. But the key, obviously, I think everybody that's used this has knows this, is you have to find an influencer that really fits you, fits your brand, has the personality, has the, sort of credibility uh, and the authenticity that fits with what you stand for in the marketplace. So, you know, you, you can just hire a pretty face. They don't tend to work very well, right? <laughs> you really do have to, when that alignment is really good, that's, that's magic. It's a magical place to be. So we, we knew that influencer could be a very powerful uh, concept for us. And we also know if, you know, the idea of creating a character you know, I mean, the insurance companies do it all the time. A lot of companies, you know, all states mayhem guy or whether it's flow with progressive or, you know, there's, there's interesting ways that you can bring a, a story about a company to life through a character. And so we came with, we looked at a ton of ideas as you can imagine, but this idea of chief identity champion as a member of the management team, right? Literally, in fact, Terry Cruz, who we ended up selecting is on our website as, a, as our chief identity champion. It just started to resonate and it started to resonate as we looked at all the different people that we could sort of go and get. Terry specifically, he is just this infectiously optimistic and um, very positive person, high energy. Um, 
but he's a champion himself. I mean, he's a Super Bowl champion, uh, but he also champions a number of very important causes. He's a very vocal um, uh, supporter of a number of important uh, issues. And it just felt so good, that alignment. And so we created a, a, a character and we went and cast Terry Crews in that character and, and told a and created a bunch of a whole mass of content around him and it's and we're live and it's it's performing exceptionally well. Well, we'll get to that in a second, but I first of all, I think you had to shoot this in the middle of COVID. And you know, there was a period where you couldn't shoot anything. Right. And uh Talk a little bit about, because that much, that's a story in and of itself, because I don't, uh, honestly, there aren't that many uh, shoots going on. Talk about that yeah. and, you know, yeah. the good news, bad news of all of yeah. that. Well, the timing was great. I had it been in the middle of summer. I'm not sure we could have pulled it off anywhere. Uh, it happened to be September uh, and things were starting to kind of slowly turn back on. So we were able to secure Terry uh, and we were able to secure a production crew and a location and, you know, all the things you have to do to do a shoot. We ended up doing it in LA to make it easy for Terry and just a work around calendars. What was interesting is most of the people that we cast in the spots were uh, hadn't worked in six, seven, eight months. And so the, the, the industry was just starting to come back to life a little bit. So our timing was exquisite. Uh, and I won't, you know, I mean, for luck, I mean, I'll call it luck. I'm not going to take any credit for it. But we were able to actually be able to do the shoot and we had a lot of, we had 400 submissions for a handful of, of extra characters to shoot with Terry uh, and some really big names. I mean, people that are on uh, television shows, movies uh, have done multiple commercials. I know some, these weren't, these weren't just bit actors, they were some big names. Um, and then Terry himself, uh, obviously he was so excited to get involved with this. He loved the concept, loved it, loved it, loved it. And, um, and, and just engaged with it so forcefully uh, and then the timing was right for him too. So we pulled the shoot off. It was, it was very COVID strict, you know, as you can imagine. I mean, we all had to show up with our negative test results before we could go in. We had to, there was, I mean, strict observance of the six foot rule, everyone wearing a mask. We washed our hands every 10 minutes. It seemed like we had hand sanitizer everywhere. So, and I mean, so Hollywood took this very seriously, uh, but it, it just turned out phenomenal. And mostly because Terry was so magnetic. He was so wonderful in the role and he just owned it. He just, he lived it and owned it. And it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I got to say, and I, I just decided as, as you were talking that we're going to edit the, the whole spot into the video version of this show. Uh, and part of the reason is as I'm watching this, what I really, uh, I'm really a fanboy here. Cause I, as I was watching it, I marveled at his acting skills as he was going from character to character. And, and of course, there's a little bit of that. Well, there's not a little bit. There's a lot of the old spice sort of sort of working as uh, as he goes through the scenarios. Uh, but it in the context of what you're talking about, and as you, and you you come away, oh, yep, okay, identity champion, I get it. Uh, and Ping hadn't heard of you before. Now I have. Thanks, Terry. I yeah, mean, exactly. Boom. Yeah. Well, and 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 that's exactly why because it's it's traveled so well too. We've had so many. Um, comments back to us and, and we've had, you know, we, this is an industry, just if you talk about identity and access management, right, a lot of people don't know a lot about it. It's a, you know, it's, it's in the cybersecurity uh, superset, right? And you go and you look at the content that exists in that industry. It's pretty staid. It's pretty technical. It's pretty product centric. No one's actually trying to tell a story and bring something to life like this. And so we've had comments come back so many, just, I, I love your spots. I'm laughing. I've never seen you. You're so much different than your competitors. And it was almost like a layup in many ways because we're, we're so, you know, th this is a space that focuses on safety, right? And right. so by definition, the marketing tends to be safe. Right. And safe is easy. And safe is easy to sell into your management team. But it's also not something that's going to really differentiate you in a way that's going to create attention. I mean, at the end of the day, what are we trying to do as marketers anyway? What we're really trying to do with advertising specifically is you're trying to rent a little space in the mind of your buyer. That's when you're ultimately, you're trying to get them to know you and remember you, right? And you can't do that by being really safe, especially when they're bombarded with messages every day, right? So that's kind of the, all those pieces coming together. And then just the great performance of Terry, it's very memorable. Um, and, and so we've been, we've been so gratified. In fact, I have to tell you one little anecdote. 
Uh, Drew, you'll love this. I just, this happened just last week. Got an email into uh, our CEO from a prospect CEO. And he says, hey, we want to do business with you. Uh, we want to engage you. To, you know, can you connect me to the right people? Because we want to have, and he quoted, sweet, secure digital experiences, which is exactly what Terry says in all of our spots. And I just, I just broke out laughing. So I'm thinking we got a, prospect, a CEO of a prospect company quoting our chief identity champion in an email to our CEO about wanting to do business with us. So we're, we're getting, and I, I just had one yesterday came in, same thing. So it's really, really gratifying to see the, the traction that it's gaining. That's awesome. All right, we're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the scientific method of measuring this kind of thing and what you need to do if you hope to uh, make the case six months from now that this was as successful as, as we're talking about now. So stay with us. Okay, we're back and let's just set the stage. We had a great strategy we did a lot of work on. Um, we had an initial round of execution that showed that the, the idea had promise, but the execution wasn't as distinctive as it could. Find a, a spokesperson slash character slash influencer that perfectly matches the brand, tells the story in a highly effective way. Great, we have anecdotes that suggest the program is working, but I know that anecdotes alone you know, you can't eat anecdotes. So let's talk about the, the measurements that you've seen so far and what you expect, you know, I mean, brand tracking, for example, do you have that in place? Yes, we will, we will do that on, a, on an annual cadence where we'll do brand, not only brand tracking, but we'll do brand surveys to measure awareness and so forth. So, yeah. So brand tracking essential because if you're if we're really talking about awareness now we have to you know it's not going to be against the entire universe but against your target audience did we right. move the needle so you have to have some kind of brand tracking in place if you're yeah. going to sell an awareness okay yeah. let's talk about the surrogate often for um, awareness would be uh, some kind of a share of voice and website traffic let's talk about those uh, yeah. you know. Or what are your sort of your next metrics after after yeah. awareness? Well, it all boils down to I and mean, I, what I always talk when, I, especially when I'm talking to the CFO and the CEO, the conversation is: Look, marketing exists not to do fun campaigns. We exist to acquire customers. Full stop. Everything we do is about the acquisition of new customers. Now, there's different tactics and different things that you sequence in market and different choreography of messages and so forth that you construct in a way that sort of optimizes that. And we, so we have a pipeline that we look at and we, we have all of the funnel that you would, you know, that you, that you know good and well that we sort of cover. The investments we make in awareness are not about making us feel good and not about having a good time and not even, you know, about hiring some famous person. It's, we are trying to expand awareness to drive new customer acquisition. So what we do initially is we measure our marketing ROI across the whole funnel. And that is something we take to the board on a regular basis. We track our, our MROI very, very closely. Now, obviously this just started. So can I point to specific new revenue? Well, I can now, but it's still pretty small. <laughs> but you know, I'm not gonna be able to demonstrate in 2020 that my 2020 investments in awareness are paying off yet. But there's some there are some leading indicators that we now look at and there, and there's a bunch of them, right? So in fact, I just reviewed a set of indicators this morning, right? We're looking at all of our execution. So for example, we've done takeovers on the BBC or Wall Street Journal or, you know, the New York Times and other places as just one of our digital executions among the many. We look at, we, and we look at all the things. We have specific impression targets. We have specific engagement rates and click-through rates and traffic to the website. We look at all those indicators, we benchmark them, and we can see, hey, is this resonating? We, you can start to see, if, is the content resonating? Are engagement rates what you want them to be? Or are they trending above even the benchmarks that you wanna see? That starts to tell you, okay, I can't prove ROI yet, but I can start to prove that I'm onto something or I'm not onto something, right? And what's great for us is we've seen really high engagement rates. We've seen our traffic to the website directly attributable to this campaign is up over a thousand percent. You know, these are things that you're like, yeah, okay, now I'm getting people in to my, to my ecosystem now and they're learning more about me. And now as I continue to have my conversation with them and I start to talk to them about my special product that I want them to consider buying, 
my effectiveness is going to go up. So what I always tell people, and this is really important, awareness investments are like the R&D arm of marketing. They, they tend to pay off, but over a longer period of time. Now, I'm still accountable for every dollar I spend, and I don't shy away from that. But I have parsed those dollars off, and the CFO is comfortable knowing that we're going to measure this not in year four in year. We're going to let this have a two to three year horizon where we invest in this. But we should start to see 2021 and 2022 really kicking in the um, increased effectiveness for all of our demand gen efforts. And I have no doubt that that's going to take place. So we, we kind of do it that way. Hold totally accountable for the whole the whole bucket, but we we do view these dollars in a little bit of a longer time horizon than we do our direct demand gen campaigns that we uh, have in market now. And um, now I'm imagining so interesting the takeovers. You I mean even though you started by talking about uh, earn media, you need to plant in order to really get impressions numbers and get in front. Of, you need to spend some dollars, and so. Absolutely. You, yeah. It sounds like you did uh, a fair amount of digital takeovers. You mentioned Wall Street Journal, BBC, any any sort of other sort of big, uh, yeah. I mean, that would be enough, but. Um, yeah, we did a lot of targeted display and banners, you would expect. We did a lot of connected TV for video uh, content. Um, and uh, and then our digital, our digital was across a number of different channels. I just rattled off a few to you before, but we had, you know, we had some pretty good animated spots and. Um, and some rich digital media spots that were, uh, uh, and, and, and some uh, digital media partnership uh, 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 executions. So it was, it was a pretty, you know, again, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't my old Intel budget where we, you know, we had a lot of money we could spend, but, and so we're not doing uh, broadcast TV, but we right. are doing a lot of connected TV, which is, which is a great medium because you can target really effectively using connected TV, but it allows you to use video to tell your story. So it's a really a, a, all of those, um, again, mostly digital, some connected TV. Uh, and so, and just to make sure, and I'm, when we're talking like a Roku, and are we talking uh, where you can actually buy uh, sort of uh, with them, um, uh, where actually you can buy against email lists? Yeah, you can, and a lot of it's programmatic, and you sort of right. tune that, that, that you tune that with all the indicators that, and, and, and variables that you want for your targeting. Uh, and so it's hard to say, you know, unlike my broadcast media buys back when I was at Intel, where you knew I was going to be on this television show, or I was running an ad on the Super Bowl, or whatever it was we were doing. Here, it's it's hard to say because again, it's all programmatic and it's sort of related to where your where your target audience is going to be. But it's been uh, it's been quite effective actually. Now we're seeing, for example, it's one of the things we look at. Back to your metric thing, we look at we look at the spots on YouTube, for example, and we look at okay. Okay, great. I got a bunch of views. That's awesome. But what's my retention rate? And retention rate really is how much of the video on average are people watching? So I may have, you know, you may see a piece of content that has millions of views, but if the retention rate is 30, 40%, how effective really are you being? But right. the first month of this, our YouTube videos were getting retention rates north of 90%, which is freakish. Right? So it's people were completing the video. For the most part, completing the video, right. which is crazy, right? I mean, because so, YouTube counts completions after like six seconds, so uh, yeah. Yeah. you have to. That's why the retention is really important because it gives you a sense of really, on average, how much of the video is actually being watched. Right. And uh, right. anything sort of north of forty to fifty percent is considered very good, right? Right. Okay. Uh, so we were, we were again. It's just a fun, engaging spot that's kind of different, and unique. Uh, so I think that's what's really helping drive those numbers up. So. If uh, we've got the courage, by the way, to go after a character that is unexpected in the category, <laughs> or artful in the way that both that was executed, I'm wondering, was there any other element of, because we, we talk about the video a lot, but there are other components of the cruise campaign that you could sort of point to and say, you know, this was a great little version of that. Yeah, well, we do. You, you, you'll probably have the one we have. A, we, we also created a, what we call hot tips. We call them industry hot tips. And they're really short vignettes where Terry comes in and talks about, you know, a very specific issue that maybe an employee has, you know, being productive working from home or maybe one that uh, someone who's on the road, even though COVID, we're not doing a lot of traveling these days, but, you know, it'll apply at some point. Uh, or there's another one where, you know, a little vignette where uh, this woman logs into a website to buy something and then she wants to go back and buy something new, but the website forgets who she is and has to start all over. They're really funny little vignettes. We've got a whole series of stories and vignettes 
different lengths and, and so forth. And then we're also using Terry in a personal way. For example, just today, we had two calls with Terry with two major customers of ours. And, they, and it was, again, it's another little benefit that we negotiated to get some time with him. And he's so good at it. He loves doing it. But we have we had one that's a, a, a customer that's contemplating a major you know, sort of purchase of, of product and another one that just completed a major purchase of a product. And it was one of those just really awesome little touches that you can mm-hmm. give a customer that they could have a private conversation with somebody like this and just and they just they had they, they ate it up. So, you know, we're using him in social a lot of. A lot of uh, short vignettes in social media that we're, we're recording. We use them in audio in a lot of, we're, we're doing a podcast now that we're getting ready to launch that uh, we have, we're using Terry and a lot of the promotion of that throughout. So we're using him in a lot of ways. And his, again, his energy and his magnetism just comes across and it just, it just makes things more effective than if it was just a standard, you know, anybody. Right. So uh, we could, we've covered courage uh, in spades, artful ideation, lots of interesting ways that you've executed. Um, thoughtful, it's interesting to me, you did cover employees, we did cover customers and how you're using that. And of course, uh, in this, uh, these little vignettes, to me, sort of could, I would call them entertainment, but also service, edutainment. So yeah, sure. we're measuring what matters, um, you're automating, uh, Let's sort of wrap this up and say, what what haven't you done yet with this campaign that you anticipate uh, doing uh, in the near future? Yeah, great question. So I think where we go next with this is even more personalized, right? Getting industry specific. Um, so we told the big story. We got the platform right. Then we told the story and engaged people with the story. Now I'm going to make it even more personal for our customers. So we're going to do more industry-specific verticals. So think of almost almost ABMing this type of campaign where we're going to get one-to-few and even more one-to-one types of content and storytelling out of Terry that we think will be very, very uh, effective, in, especially in, in, the, in the product that we sell and, in, and to who we sell it to. So that's kind of where we're headed with the next evolution of this is even more refined and targeted and specific and custom. Right. So create the halo, big idea. Then we bring it all the way down. And now we're now we're in a, yeah, it's de- generating demand and it's completely connected to the yeah. bigger idea, which is, it, which is it's amazing. It's that connective tissue that's so, so, so important in all the marketing that you do. And it's easy to separate each piece of that. And you really, really have to think about how do they work together so that one plus one plus one starts to equal maybe four or even five. So that's what we're getting, we're driving for. Very cool. All right. We've got a bunch of CMOs listening and they're going, oh man, I'd love to do something this cool uh, that builds awareness. So let's give them two do's and a don't in selling an awareness to their CEOs and boards. Well, uh, yeah, I think the most important thing I did that was so helpful was rely on data. There's a lot of great data out there that helps you make your case. Why awareness is so important. And, and, and always couch it in, and this is what we, I, I mentioned earlier, it was so helpful with the CFO. He knows, because he hears me say it all the time, and we talk about it all the time. All of this is targeted at acquiring new customers. It's all about growth. It's just how you go about it. So don't parse off an awareness campaign as some sort of this thing over here that's kind of our feel-good marketing. It's not. It's all about creating an environment for you to acquire more customers and ultimately grow. And there's great data out there that shows that companies that invest both in awareness and demand gen ultimately over a three year period have a much higher growth rate than if you just do demand gen only. And the problem is so many people are very short term oriented with marketing, which is why CMOs have the shortest tenure in the C-suite because there's an impatience that's growing. So it's tough, it's a tough sell because they don't wanna hear that you're gonna help drive demand over a three year period. They wanna know about what you're doing tomorrow. Well, we are doing things for tomorrow, but I'm also doing things for the longer term. And thankfully, um, if if you construct that story well and you really work with your CEO uh, and your CFO, and they're both big supporters of this now. So when we go in front of the board, it's it's actually gone very, very, very well. Uh, That's amazing. that was a bunch of to-do. Sorry, I think I- oh, that was perfect, and I, I think that's a, I, I think that's a great place for us to to wrap up uh, this show. Uh, I uh, boy, it was 
Byron Sharp, Professor Byron Sharp, who wrote the book, How Brands Grow, is smiling as he's listening to this, got go, hey, Byron, or Professor Sharp, here's another case for you and shows that it works in B2B. All right, Kevin, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Drew, for having me. It was great. Love to do it. And to all our listeners, gee, I hope you got as excited about this uh, this idea in this show as, as I did. If you did, share the show with a friend. Don't forget to rate us on your favorite podcast channel. Um, and then I'm going to wrap it up with Renegade Thinkers Unite is written and directed by Drew Neiser. Hey, that's me. Audio production is by Sam Beck. Show notes are written by Melissa Caffrey. The music is by the amazing Burns Twins. And the intro voiceover is Linda Cornelius. To find the transcripts of all episodes, suggest future guests, or learn more about quite possibly the savviest B2B marketing agency in New York City, visit renegade.com. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.